you bow your heads as we go to the Lord in prayer? Father, we just, we just worship you. You are the great creator. You are the great I am. Lord, you are good and you are so faithful. Even in the midst of some of the most chaotic times in our lives. And Lord, I just thank you for the worship that has already been taking place in this sanctuary. And Lord, it's our prayer, it's our cry that your spirit would just overwhelm us. And Lord, as we lift our hearts and our praise up to you, and as we seek to exalt the name of Jesus, Lord, would this worship just be a sweet-smelling aroma before your throne? And God, would you bring transformation in our lives because we can't have an encounter with you without it changing us. And so, Lord, as we're transitioning now to the preaching and teaching of your word, Lord, and as we open the, the word of life, Lord, I just pray, God, that you would just move in a powerful way. And God, we just eagerly want more of you and we seek your face. And we pray this together now in Christ's name. Amen. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and pull them out. As you can see, our screens are down uh, for another week. We're, we're hoping they may be back up before Easter. Um, but nevertheless, uh, we want you to have your, your Bibles. And if you don't have a, a hard one with you, hopefully you got a Bible app or something on your phone that you can uh, pull those out. We're going to be in the book of James. Now, I get it's Palm Sunday, uh, and, but we're going to stay in the book of James this uh, morning. Uh, but as we... Um, come back Friday evening uh, for our Good Friday service. Uh, we're going to have a service there and uh, really begin to, to unpack all the things that, that took place that week uh, of pa the Passion Week and then looking forward to Easter Sunday and celebrating uh, that with you next week. So we will take a break from James uh, as we go into next weekend. But this morning we're in James and we're talking about faith that works. And really, uh, when you look at this book uh, and the series of messages that we're looking at and have been looking at, you could make the argument that what James is arguing uh, is for us to be pushed and challenged to respond uh, with whatever it is that we may be walking through uh, with maturity. It's really a call to spiritual maturity. And in his recipients who were a part of his church, the church in Jerusalem that were scattered, as we saw in the book of Acts, uh, they're just bewildered. Their whole life is turned upside downwards because of the gospel and, and because of their heart for Jesus. And so they're scattered abroad and they don't know what's going on at the time. They don't know what they're dealing with. Um, hindsight is twenty twenty, and we can look back and read the book of Acts and we can see that God was at work in the midst of their trials and their tribulations because we can see where Jesus said that the gospel starts in Jerusalem, then goes Judea, Samaria, and other ends of the world. And he used persecution as the vehicle for the gospel to go forth. But they're living in the midst of that and they can't see that. Just like some of you may be walking through some really trying times and you're crying out and you're asking God, why? Why is this happening? Or, or will you change my circumstances or my situations? And it seems as if your prayer is not being answered and you're being challenged, I think, in this series of messages to respond in faith and to walk by faith and to trust God. Same is true for the recipients of this letter, the original recipients. Like I said, hindsight's twenty twenty. It's easy to look back and say, oh, I can see where God was at work here and why he was at work there and why he prolonged not answering the prayer the way I was praying uh, you know, for, for so long and, and why he waited here and waited there. It's so easy to look back and see those things. But man, when you're in the midst of it, in the trenches of it, it's just a whole other ball game. And so when we read this, James is just challenging his church, his congregants, and no doubt the Holy Spirit challenging you and I to keep our eyes on Jesus and to worship God and to, even in the midst of our brokenness, even in the midst of our uncertainty, and trust Him because He's good and He's faithful. And that He is, he is, he is, he is just so good. And really that we are to live on the promises of God. We don't, we don't walk by sight, we walk by faith. And I'll remind you this morning that once again, the book of Hebrews tells us that it is impossible to please God apart from faith. Impossible to please God apart from faith. And when you're walking through something, we want the answers. We want to know what not only step one is, but step two, step three, step four. We, we need details. But the child of God is not given details. 
The child of God has given promises. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. I'm still writing your story. Trust me. Trust in the goodness of God. Walk by faith and watch me work. And so James is reminding his recipients as well as you and I this morning that if we really have faith, then it's going to produce works in our lives. And so this morning as we look at verses 14 through 26, it can be a gut punch for some. Because it's real easy to give intellectual sin. It's real easy to say amens in the 11 o'clock church hour on Sunday morning. It's a whole nother ball game when it comes Monday morning. And you've got to deal with the reality of what you're dealing with. But your faith has to have faith. It has to have work. And so he's calling all of us. I believe God is calling us to, to respond and to grow in our spiritual walk. And so hopefully you found your place. James chapter 2 verse 14 He asks this question, he says, what does it profit, my brethren, if someone says that he has faith, but he does not have works, can faith save him? Literally reading, can that faith save him? Can that kind of faith save him? One that just gives intellectual assent, one that that says all the right things, but yet there's no fruit in what's taking place. I mean, it's so easy to say how good God is and how much you trust him and how much you believe in him. But if you're never willing to take the car out of park, and put it in drive, and take those steps of faith, then really does your profession, or what you claim to profess, does it possess you? Meaning, does it it have feet? Is it being put into action? Because the reality is that James is preaching, or teaching, or writing, that there is, that when there's true salvation, there's transformation. As a matter of fact, I'm going to go ahead and give you the three... uh, words that I want you to remember when you think about faith and works and you look at the the life of James because I I think that he says this over and over again in the epistle but especially in this part is that when there's true salvation there's going to be true transformation that means there's going to be a change does it mean that we can't fall in some of our um, sinful ways we're all sinners right we're saints because of what Jesus has done for us but we're still battling with the sinful nature so it doesn't mean that we don't fall short, doesn't mean that we don't mess up, doesn't mean that we don't blow it sometimes. If you're dealing with shame, let me remind you what I remind you often, uh, 1 John 1, 9, that if we'll confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So as children of God, when we blow it, the grace of God's there to cleanse us and restore that fellowship. But we have to realize that when there's true salvation, there's transformation. And people's transformation or sanctification and growth process um, it looks different from different people. For some people, there's this Damascus Road experience. There's just like, boom! It's just dr- dramatic change. For others, it may be a little bit of a slower process. But nevertheless, there's change and there's transformation. So we're going to see this morning that faith that has works is a life when there's genuine faith that there's transformation that's a part of that. But equally, it's going to be a life of sacrifice. To where you're going to to minister at a high level where it becomes costly to you that life is no longer centered on you but it's on serving others because we understand the great command to love the lord your god with all of your heart your soul your mind your strength and what to love your neighbor as yourself and i get that we're in a day and age to where people are just taxing and it's weary and there's so much just foolishness and sin and all of the above but We cannot allow people to steal our joy. We cannot allow the enemy to steal our our joy and heart for people. Because Jesus came on a search and rescue mission for what? For people. And if we're going to be the hands and feet of Jesus, it's going to be about reaching people. And so we can't become to where we don't like people. And so we're going to have to give at a high level sacrificially. And then the third word that I would give you is surrender. And there's a little bit of difference between sacrifice and surrender. Uh, Surrender, it's both costly and both has to do with putting yourself on the altar. But surrender, as we're going to see this morning, has to be at a point to where if we're going to walk by faith, that there's going to be times that God is going to challenge us to give up our hopes, our dreams. We're not going to understand what he's doing or what he's calling us for. And and we're just going to have to let go and trust him to walk by faith. And we're going to see those three things over and over again this morning. Because James is wanting to remind his readers that, hey, your world may be falling apart. But nonetheless, God's called you to walk by faith. And if you are saying amen, but yet you're not putting anything into practice, he says, is your faith the real thing? And while we may blow it every once in a while, we can't live in that 
just continual rebellious state. If there's never been a change, there's never been salvation. And so let's dive into this together. And so I want to start off, I guess, by just asking you this simple question. And this is maybe the question we ask ourselves as we're examining and we're walking through this text together. Does what you believe affect the way you live? Does what you affirm on Sunday morning affect what you're walking through? And how you respond? And your outlook on life? I mean, for example, if, if you're there and you're walking through something and you are just, it's just doom and gloom and spiritually you got your arms crossed and you just are just as miserable as miserable can be, chances are you're making everybody else around you miserable, but, but, miserable, but if that is you, that is the fruit of what's going on spiritually. Now, as a believer, we can get there. We're, we're capable of any sin under the sun. But if that's where you are, that is a telltale sign that the fruit that's coming out of your life is rotten. And I don't care what the circumstance may be. And it's a deeper issue because it's a spiritual issue. And I'm not making light of any trial or circumstance or hurt because they're real and they're heavy. And I get that. And I'm with you. And I'm there. And, and I've been that rotten fruit being produced in my life many times before. But I'll remind you that if you are a child of God and that's you, then you are the most miserable among miserable people because you're not walking by faith. And you're not taking God and living on the promises of God. And just as you heard that was sung just before I got up here, there's a lot of things that we walk through, but you've got to trust God and you've got to live on His promises. And a lot of times God is doing and allowing things to come our way through a refining fire that He may grow us. And that's certainly the case for many of the recipients that James is writing to from his church at the time of this epistle. And so he gives us an example. Notice verse 15. He says, If a brother or sister is um, naked or destitute of daily food, and he says, And one of you say to them, Depart in peace, be warm, be filled. He says, But you do not give them the things that, they are, that are needed uh, for the body. He says, What does it profit? And then he says in verse uh, 17, Thus also faith by itself, it do, if it does not have works, it's dead. And so James gives an illustration. He says, So suppose uh, you have somebody in your life... Um, that, that comes to you and, and let's just say for an example we have service and somebody comes in and they uh, are just poorly dressed he didn't mean when he said no he didn't mean in the original he's not saying that they were in their birthday suits he's just saying that their their attire was was so shabby and 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 so just there wasn't much there that they weren't properly attired for the weather to meet the you know what was before them and so they they're poorly dressed they have um just horrible clothing they have no food he says maybe you come together and and you worship together or whatever and, and we come together on Sundays we worship somebody like that is here and then you leave here and you go on the mad rush to catch lunch somewhere and as you're walking into the restaurant you see them um, standing outside and they tell you that they don't they just don't have a whole lot of money and and they're hungry and they don't have a lot of food uh, clothing I mean well, what do you do I mean if you were to say well, well I'm going to be praying for you you know, that sounds spiritual, but, but if you're going to just pray and you're not going to be willing to take the step to meet those needs, is that, real, is that real genuine faith? Is that what it means to live out your faith? And James says, no, absolutely not. He says, it's not just talking about the fact that, hey, I'm going to pray for you. And I've said this before, and I'll say it again. Prayer is a dangerous thing. Be careful, because when you pray, and you're praying to meet, for God to meet someone's need, that is needed, nine times out of ten, the person that he's burdened to pray for is the person he's going to raise up to minister. And so prayer can very much be a dangerous thing. And you've heard me say, you know how big I am on prayer. There's much we can do after we pray. There's very little we're going to do with kingdom significance until we pray. But here's the deal. If our faith doesn't have feet to where we're willing to be inconvenienced and to minister sacrificially, then really we got to ask the question, are we really getting what we're proclaiming that we've got as far as what God is, is doing in our lives and wanting to do through our lives? And so the, the, the question we ask, does, you, does what you believe affect the way you live? And so the first statement would be this. True faith calls for sacrificial service. Sacrifice. That means that we've got to be willing to be inconvenienced. The reason that we don't minister at a high level and that our faith doesn't have feet is because we don't want to be inconvenienced. We don't want our plans to be interrupted. 
or that it may cost us something. And I remind you that Jesus issued the call. He says, whoever wants to come after me, let him deny himself, let him take up his cross, and let him follow me. And then he says in Matthew 4, 19, he says, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. So you put those two verses together, the issues that has to deal with our call in being Christ's followers, what's involved? Their sacrifice and their surrender. And then as we follow Jesus, guess what happens? He brings transformation in our lives. And as he brings transformation in our lives, we have a heart for people. So if we're going to gather on Sunday mornings, we're going to talk about how good Jesus is, but we don't have a heart for people, then there's a huge disconnect. And I remind you that Jesus left the heavenly realms and all the glory that he was experiencing there, and he left there, clothed himself in humanity. We know what Philippians 2 says. Because he he emptied himself, he veiled his glory, he took on the form of human flesh, he walled the dusty uh, roads of Jerusalem, and and all of that that we see as we read the New Testament. He goes to the cross of Calvary and he dies a sacrificial death on your behalf and my behalf, and it was a costly thing. And we're going to say, hey, we're followers of Jesus, But yet God puts ministry opportunities in front of us over and over again. And you know that when it happens, you're going to be inconvenienced. And we say, I don't want anything to do. I just kind of turn our hearts off to it. And then we want to turn around and get in the car and turn on praise and worship music and talk about how good God is. There's a huge disconnect in that. And we have to view ourselves as being on mission with God. Listen, I get that there's people in our culture that manipulate the system. I get that sometimes the best way you can love people is tell them no. But you cannot allow those people to be used by the enemy to give you a hard heart towards people. That we've got to be willing to serve and to give and to minister on a high level. And here's the thing, most of us, when we give, we like to give out of our abundance. I mean, think about it, when we tithe, God blesses us, he gives us $1,000, we'll we'll give $100 back to the church, we give a tithe, and we feel good about ourselves. But when do we give out of our necessities? When's the last time that you served in such a level that you made a need that it actually cost you something? Well, you said, well, if I had $1,000 and I gave $100 to the church in tithes and offerings, I gave up something, and that is true. But I'll remind you that when Jesus was talking, we used the, the widow that gave the two mites as an example in the Gospels. He says she gave more than all. Why? Because she didn't give out of her abundance. She gave out of her necessity. When's the last time that you've been on mission with God and tender to God as far as the working of the Holy Spirit in your life, that your eyes were open, that you were willing to be used by God for you to, your time to be inconvenienced and for you to give whatever that resource may be sacrificially where it actually costs you something? You said, you know what, I'm going to give up this day of playing golf. I'm going to give up this trip that I may be going on. I'm going to give up this lunch. I'm going to give up whatever it may be to meet the need of someone else that God has placed in my life because I have a heart for them and I want to reach them with the gospel and I want to see them grow. That's radical. But it's biblical. But most of us, if we're honest, our focus is so much on ourselves that he's like, Lord, I'm just living my life and, and I just need you to bless me and mine as I go and do. And then when you deal with the context of what James is writing this, the recipients of this letter are uprooted from their homes. They don't know what in the world, what in the world God's doing. Their resources are limited. Most of them are poor already. And James says, oh, by the way, let me push you to maturity. Your world's turned upside downwards. Don't think that that's an excuse for you not to minister. You know, I'm reminded that, and I say this often, that as we, especially as we approach the Easter weekend, as we celebrate that, as we celebrate it every Sunday, but I'm reminded of that upper room experience, and you've heard me say this often, and I'll say it again, that when Jesus was in the upper room hours before he goes to the cross, if there was ever a time for him to be pampered, if there was ever a time for the focus to be on him, it was then. But there, his disciples, 
leading up to the upper room were arguing who's going to sit at the right and left hand. Who's, who's going to have the place of glory? It was there that Satan entered into Judas's heart and he went and he betrayed him. It was there and when they left there and he goes in the Garden of Gethsemane, he's asking his inner circle God, hey, pray for me. And they're just like falling asleep and falling short. And he's there. He's alone. But it's in that upper room that he's willing to put on the attire of a servant and wash their feet. And I'm reminded of that as I read this passage because many of you are wearied and you're tired and you're saying, man, I just, I, I'm just overwhelmed. And my response to you is that you worship and you walk by faith. Because when you worship and you walk by faith is when you're going to see God show up and you're going to see God use you. And He will call you to not only give sacrificially, but He will call you, to, as we're going to see in a few moments, to surrender. And it's in the midst of that that God does some of His finest work. He's already promised to give us joy, to give us wisdom. The Scripture says over and over again that He'll never leave us nor forsake us, that He is the great overcomer. So I don't care what it is that you're walking through, I don't care what it is that you're going through, I am not making light of it one bit, because I have trials and tribulations that I walk through as well. And there are many times that I have absolutely blown it but the place that God has revealed to me through this study and he's just shown me over and over again is, Kevin, you've got to let go and you've got to worship. And the way you're going to worship is that you're going to respond by faith. And as I put people in your path to minister to, I'm going to use your brokenness for my glory. And I'll tell you something. There's times that, that I've ministered and I've been serving, and in my heart, I've cried out, Lord, would just somebody minister to me? And there are many of you that have and, and do to our family over the years, and I am so thankful of that. So that is not a cry for help. It's just saying that I get it. I understand it. I know. But if we're going to be like our Lord, then he's going to lead us in the moments and situations like that. And our faith has to have feet. And it's the fiery trials that really reveal where we are spiritually. And let me say this before we move on. Have you ever thought for a moment that maybe what you're walking through may be the very platform that God's given you to proclaim His goodness and His faithfulness? Even in the midst of your brokenness and uncertainty. For you to say, you know what, I don't know what God's doing, but I know this. I'm living on His promises, and I know that He's good, and I know that He's faithful, and I choose to worship. And so James gives this example. He says, you, you, you have somebody in your path that needs to be ministered to. Will you serve and will you minister sacrificially? Will you allow your time to be interrupted? Will you give out of your resources, even if it's not out of your abundance, but out of your necessities, even if it's a costly thing, will you still be available to God? Because that's faith that works. Verse 18 he says, but someone will say, you have faith and I have works. He said, well, then show me your faith without your works and I'll show you uh, my faith by your works. If your life was put on display right now, would you be found guilty of being a follower of Jesus Christ based on the fruit that's coming out of your life, based on your service, based on your works? The fruit of the Spirit, we, we looked at that a few weeks ago, right? The, the love and the, 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 the joy and the peace and the gentleness, the self-control, all of those things, the attributes but does the service match it? Are you giving and serving? Do you see yourself on mission with God? You see, what we do here on Sunday mornings is that we come together corporately and we raise the roof with our praises, with our thanksgiving. We open the scriptures. We proclaim the truth of the scriptures. We're strengthened and edified one another, by one another. Uh, and then we worship an audience of one God. And in that, we are strengthened and encouraged. We see the, and experience the family of God. And then we go right back out there and we get back at it, at making much of the name of Jesus, even in the fact in the midst of our brokenness or even when it feels like we're, being, we're just wasting away. Because we're not. Because the kingdom of God is being built through you and through God's people. Verse 19. He says, you believe that there's one God. He says, you do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. So he said, there's a way you can have an intellectual belief. And I mean, we're living in a, in a land that is really post-Christian. 
right? Especially in the South. You know, everybody is, is a believer. But yet you drill down and you begin to talk with them um, and you just examine them. You find out that just because they have an orthodox view of who Jesus Christ is doesn't necessarily mean that there's been transformation in their life. Doesn't necessarily mean that they're a follower of Jesus Christ. And I'll say it again, that, that unless there's transformation, there is no salvation. Salvation is not giving intellectual assent. Salvation is not just believing in the tenets of the faith. Listen, the demons have an orthodox view of who God is. They don't deny the truth of scriptures. They just reject it. And they live in a spirit of rebellion. And if you or someone says, I believe, I believe, I believe, but yet there's a disconnect, you may say it with your mouth and you may even believe it in your mind and give an intellectual sense, but you have zero desire to place your faith in Jesus Christ and as far as there's, 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 there's looking to Him and there's surrender of your life to Him, which is part of faith. Salvation involves the mind, the emotion, and the will. God, here I am, save me. I'm looking to Jesus. And there's a lot of people that will give intellectual assent. They will say amen, but they have zero intention of truly following Jesus Christ with their lives. And because of that, there's a many of people that Jesus will say to him in that day, them on that day, depart from me, I never knew you. Listen, we have to be careful when we examine people's lives because there's been times in our lives people have looked at us and said, I'm not too sure he or she is a believer. So we've got to be careful with that. But here's the reality. If there's somebody in your life that says that they know Christ, but they have zero interest in spiritual matters, and that's been the entirety of their life, then let's quit kidding ourselves and saying that they know Jesus. Because it always produces fruit and work. He says that even the demons believe and tremble. Notice verse 20. He says, but do you want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Verse 21. He says, was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac, his son, on the altar? And we're going to unpack this a little bit here in a few moments. But look at verse 22. It says, do you see that faith was working together with his works and, his, uh, and by works faith was made perfect? Verse 23, he says, and the scriptures were fulfilled saying that Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him as righteousness and he was called a friend of God. You want to be called a friend of God? It's impossible, once again, to please God if we're not willing to walk by what? Faith. And then verse 24, it says, you see that a man is justified by works, not by faith only. Now, if you're reading this and, and, and maybe you're, you, you have a knowledge of the New Testament and Paul's writings, you may say, whoa, wait a second. Paul says that we're not justified by works, but by faith. And then James is saying that we're justified by works, not by faith only. Is there a contradiction here? And the response to that is no. They really just complement one another. They may seem that there's some, there's some tension. There's not tension. Because Paul's going to talk about the root of salvation. James is talking about the fruit of salvation. Paul's talking about what it means to, to, to place our faith in Jesus. James is talking about once you've done that, this is what it looks like. This is the litmus test. That this is what is produced when you've had a transformation. So what James is preaching here is that salvation brings transformation. Let me give you a few verses that you may want to jot down in the margin of your, your Bible. Look at Romans 4, verses 1 through 4. It says, What then shall we say, that Abraham our father was found according to the flesh? Verse 2. He says, For if Abraham was justified by works, uh, he, was, uh, he has something to boast about, um, but not before God. He says, what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him as what? As righteousness. God told Abraham that he was going to give him an offspring. And that offspring was going to be a blessing to the nations. That he was going to be a blessing to the world. It says, now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as a debt. And so the argument is that, that a, um, Abraham was saved by faith. And so let me give you another Bible verse, Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 10. We all know these verses. Paul says, for by grace you've been saved through faith. It's not of yourself, it's a gift of God. Verse 9, it's not of what? Of works, lest anyone should boast. So uh, James is not preaching a different gospel. What James is preaching or dealing with is the fruit. Is that if you're going to say that you love Jesus, it's time to put it in practice. It's time to take the car out of park and put it in drive. Because if there's been a transformation, then it's going to show up in your life. 
Paul makes it very clear, the root of our salvation, how we are saved, is by the grace of God. It's not what we do or what we don't do. When I stand before Jesus, he's, I mean, he's, so if he was to ask me, why should I let you into heaven? It's not going to be because I preached or because I did this or because I did that. It's simply, Lord, I don't deserve it. It's because... Christ, you died for me, and I'm resting on you and you alone. Your life, your death, your resurrection is you and you alone. You're the only reason. I'll never forget, as a young man, when I got to the point, I just was just beside myself, and I fell on my knees, and I said, Lord, I said, I give it all to you. And Jesus, I believe in you, and I surrender my life to you, and I place my faith in you. Come and save me and take all of me. Take me, I'm yours. Do what you want. Where you lead, I will follow. And you know what took place? There was transformation that took place in my life. And I was saved at that moment, before I could ever do any kind of act of good works. And by the way, you can't do enough good to, to outweigh the bad. We're sinners and rebellious at heart. We need to be redeemed. But when you place your faith in Jesus Christ, there's a, a transformation that takes place. There's a, a new heart that, that is given to you. You're born into the family of God, and he gives you a heart to want to. To want to do good, to want to please. I sin every day of my life, and I, don't, I, mean, and I despise it. I have to go before the throne of grace and ask God to forgive me. That's why Paul will say, the things that I don't want to do, I do. The things that I want to do, I don't. He says, there's really nothing good that dwells in me except Christ and Christ alone. Why? Because he understands that salvation is in Jesus. It's through grace. Um, it's by grace and it's through faith that we receive it. But here's the rest of that verse or that portion of Scripture. It says, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God has prepared beforehand that we should what? Walk in them. So why do I do good works? It's because if my salvation is real, God's producing those in me. So the root of our salvation is God's grace through faith. The fruit of our salvation is that we get the car out of park and to drive, and God begins to produce things in our life. If we walk with Jesus the way we proclaim to walk with Jesus, then it has to show up in our life. And if it doesn't show up in our life, then there's a real issue. Either there, the fellowship's broken or there's no relationship that's ever happened. And you have to, just as I do, have to answer, has that ever happened? And if it has, and you're not where you need to be, then you're miserable. And then you've got to get where you're supposed to be. And so when we go back to James, notice he, he, he was talking about the, we said Paul was the root, James is given the fruit. Let me give this one more passage of Scripture you may want to write before we jump into James. Matthew 7. Jesus is talking about false prophets here, but nevertheless, this principle is, is, is equally as true. He says, this is Jesus, he said, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing. He says, but inwardly they're what? They're ravenous wolves. Verse 16, he says, you will know them by their what? Fruit. He says, do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? He says, even so, every good tree bears good fruit and a bad tree bears bad fruit. Verse 18, he says, a good tree bears, um, bad, cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Verse Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into fire. And then notice verse 20, and this is where we're trying to get to. Therefore, by their fruits, you will know them. You're known by their fruits. And so if we have this walk with God, it's going to show up in our lives. And so back to James, when he was using Abraham, Abraham's faith in God, and it's God who saved him. It wasn't his faith, but he placed his faith there. It was God's grace that saved him. But it showed up in his work. He said, well, how did it show up in his work? That when God said to Abraham, he said, Abraham, I want you to take Isaac, and I want you to go to Mount Moriah, and I want you to offer him as a sacrifice. Now, I want you to understand the context, context of this. Abraham has no idea what God is doing at this time. Abraham has waited and he's waited and he's waited. He's been through that season. God, why are you blessing everybody else that's not as righteous as me or just downright pagans and they're like being blessed with kids and I don't have one, but yet you're telling me this and you're wanting to do something special. And then finally, after years of waiting, God blesses. And then all of a sudden God says, I want you to take your blessing and I want you to go to Mount Moriah and I want you to put a knife through him. Like, Wait a second, God. That don't make sense. And it certainly doesn't make sense with the promises that I've been living on, but yet you're asking me to do something. And when you get to this portion in this story, 
in the book of Genesis, this is the climactic point of where Abraham has come to the point that he's learned that he can trust God no matter what. And by the way, that's where God wants you. That's where God wants me. Oh, it's easy to talk about it, but when you get put in the classroom of the school of faith of having to grow, it's a whole other ball game. And so Abraham came to the point, he says, you know what? He can be trusted. And so he takes his son and he goes and he is literally bringing the knife through him. And the angel of the Lord says, stop. You've passed the test. So faith, third point, sometimes means laying down your hopes and your dreams and trusting God when things don't make sense. And you know what that's called? Surrender. Surrender. Is it God, I'm going to let go and I'm going to trust and I'm going to choose to worship and even though it feels like I am just being destroyed, and here I am, God. Because you're good and you're faithful and I'm going to live on your promises. It's a whole different level of spiritual maturity that most people never see. And you know why they never see? It's because they won't walk by faith. And they kick and they scream and they complain. This isn't fair. This isn't right. God, I don't know why you're doing this. God, I don't know why you're doing that. And it's just blah, 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 blah. And I'm not making light of whatever your blah, blah, blah is. What I am saying is that God knows. And God has an answer and he's the answer. And he's saying walk by faith. Let your faith have feet. Let your profession on Sunday match your walk on Monday. And in your brokenness, watch God do some pretty neat things. Last example. I know we're getting past that 12 o'clock hour, but hang on. James, um, wherever we left off, Don, I don't remember what verse we were on, but uh, verse 18, he says, but some will say you have, I think we were further than that, but um, 24, um, he says, you see then that the man is justified by works. <laughs> Everybody would say, 24, don't go back, don't go back. Um, <laughs> you see then that, that the man is justified by faith, or justified by works, not by faith only. Notice verse 25. Likewise, was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messenger whose uh, messengers and, and sent them out in their way. So if you understand this illustration that he gives, Rahab uh, had a real checkered past. She was part of a pagan group of people in Jericho, and she was a prostitute, a harlot, and the fear of the Lord came on her, and because of that, her life is transformed. She steps out in faith. She hides those two messengers, and then her whole family gets saved through this, and God just radically changes her. You say, well, how do you know that he radically changed her? Well, if you go to Matthew 1 and you see the genealogy, guess whose name's grafted in there? Rahab. And so you know what Rahab is a picture of? Transformation. Transformation. And here's the deal. True faith always brings real transformation. It changes how we talk. It changes how we walk. It changes how we serve. It changes how we forgive and show mercy. It changes us. And so James is saying, hey, your world's falling apart. I get it. But no excuse not to walk by faith. Because God's calling us, because he's transformed us, he's calling us to walk sacrificially and to surrender our hopes and dreams and trust him and leave the results to God. And then finally, verse 26, just as the body is without, the spirit is dead, so is faith without works dead. What say you this morning? What's your walk look like? Does your profession match the walk that you're living before people? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time together. We thank you for the opportunity of just being able to worship you and be strengthened and encouraged by your word. Lord, I thank you for your people. And Lord, I just pray during this invitation that we would just respond as you would lead. And Lord, for those individuals that may be in here that have never come to the place of placing their faith in you, Lord, I pray that right now they know that it is as simple 
as crying out and trusting in Jesus for what He's done for them and receiving His precious forgiveness by faith. Faith is just the, the way we spiritually stretch our arms out to receive what You offer for us, which is a free gift of salvation. And Lord, I pray that if there's those in here this morning that need that, that they'll do it. Lord, we give this invitation to you now in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you.